Hello, friends. So, for whatever reason, um, Bonte and Aya are not doing monk chat. So, a little while ago, they asked me to do it. So, here I am. You went from four monks down to one, unfortunately. Welcome, Charles Lee, Gita, Christine, Jerry, and Douse. We'll give some time for people to come, then we'll get started. Welcome, Gia. Welcome, cows are friend. Welcome, Metika. Welcome, Martin. This is Monk Chat, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll attempt to answer them. We'll go for the normal period of an hour and a half, or until questions are run out of, whichever comes first. Charlesley asked a question, although I don't know if I can answer it because I don't know what open awareness and choiceless awareness meditation is. I don't know if that's a Mahayana thing or or maybe I'm just not used to the words being used. Um, Charlesley, if you want to maybe clarify that so that I might know what it is, I might be able to respond to it. Yeah. I've heard it just from other teachers. It's open awareness or choiceless awareness, it's just really awareness. Whatever occurs, there's no looking at it, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or new. it's just observing whatever is occurring, whatever is happening. That's the way that I've been instructed from other hmm. people. It's just whatever is happening within the body or even outside, whatever is happening, we, we don't try and put our mind on any object. We just open our mind to whatever is occurring at that moment. Hmm. Yeah, I have no experience with such things. I wonder if it's like commentarial or something. Like access concentration, I, like kind of describing something that somebody might experience, but that's not in the suttas. I don't know. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen it in the suttas. I've never that's seen it in the suttas. No. Just look at it. It's uh, Anonymous has a question. Do Arahant's dream? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's not something that's answered, um, at least in the suttas. Uh, I'm sure maybe the tradition has come down over the centuries that say one thing or another. Um, <clears throat> but dreams are not not considered to be like um, intentional things. Uh, in the Vinaya, you see like people will do things in dreams and... Uh, and they will think that they did something and they went to the Buddha and the Buddha says, no, it's only in a dream. It doesn't count. So, you know, I mean, I'm inclined to say probably, although I don't know what exactly they would dream about.
Gita says, Austin Shumato talks about open awareness and he is from the forest tradition. Well, see, this is the, this is the thing. A lot of different teachers use a lot of different English words, but is there a poly word that's being talked about or is it just kind of something that's not grounded somewhere so that if that teacher is talking about something specifically that's not really grounded in anything, then that teacher is going to be the best one to ask that question. Jerry has a question. I'm planning to sell Buddha quotes on t-shirts. My question is, will this harm anyone as far as you can tell? Will it help the Dhamma last longer or diminish it? Mm. Well, I have a very, I have a strong aversion to anything related to Dhamma and selling. Um, but it is, a, you know, people put stuff on t-shirts all the time. Um, I guess what I would say is, if you're going to use Buddha quotes, use actual Buddha quotes, like from the suttas. Don't, don't, don't put all kinds of, you know, all those kind of silly quotes that you see on fakebuddhaquotes.com. Some interesting questions today. What is the sound of silence? Is that something one experiences as one progresses in meditation? Um, I think that's an Ajahn Sumedho thing too. Yeah, I, I've never heard of this other than with Ajahn Sumedho. I've never heard of this sound of silence thing. Um, it's probably best to talk to Ajahn Sumedho about it. I think that's a, like, there's a uh, yeah, a pretty good book. Huh? Mm. He's, I think, discussing that method. I've only used it a couple of times. You're done. Okay. Yeah. When somebody is having psychotic episodes, will whatever they're doing count as karma? as well. How about for people with dementia? Um, this is a tough question. It quite is a tough question. The, the thing with either way, it, either way, it kind of results from the comma of having a mental illness, right? This is something, um, you know, having to do with psychotic episodes, you know, if it, that is something that you're often born with right and it's something that is uh that can be triggered later in life and so you know that's something that kind of like puts you behind the eight ball right it, it puts you at a in a much harder position than the average person to act skillfully now that being said that i know senior monastics who are bipolar and, and, you know, things like that. The, the, it's not necessarily a full deterrent, but it is, you know, it, it is something that can definitely make things a lot harder than the average person. I wouldn't say it's so it, it's kind of different. This this is an interesting one. It, it really is. This is this is an interesting question because I wouldn't say it's like somebody so typically what we understand like for instance the most animals in the animal realm because they're acting completely on instinct, right? Where they don't really have the ability to, to intentionally choose various things, right? To choose to act skillfully, etc. They're animals and they're acting on instinct. So a human being with mental health issues is not just acting on instinct, right? I, I would put it as that they have more, because of 
their mental state, they have a stronger delusion delusion than the average person. They're still the the actions that they do are still unskillful. I would say they're still comma. But it is out of this stronger delusion. Right? So the um yeah. Good question. This is a very good question. There's been some interesting questions so far today. This is a very, really thought provoking question. Thank you, Miss M, for asking that question. <laughs> Martin says, I think the sound of silence is the loudest sound. So if I went to Cape Canaveral and watched this uh, shuttle launch, then <laughs> I would hear the sound of silence. Metica has, could you talk about proliferation and why it's a problem? So I'm assuming here when you say proliferation, you're talking about papancha, right? And this word is a very important thing to understand. As a matter of fact, it, it's one of my, it, it goes together with one of my two favorite pairings. There's manyati and papancha. Manyati is uh like imagining creating in the mind right imagining and creating it's a mental creation papancha is propagating these things so this idea that this is me this is mine this is myself that's manyati that's imagination <laughs> that's creation and once I've created that, then I keep propagating it. This is me. I like these things. I don't like these things. I have this view. I don't have that view. We build up these imaginings, these creations, and then we act on them, we propagate on them. Or we have um, connected to this morning when we did the Sala Sutta, right? How we have underlying tendencies towards to craving towards pleasant feelings and aversion, um, clinging towards pleasant feeling and aversion towards unpleasant feeling, right? That's propagation. An unpleasant experience arises, then your mind's like, oh, I don't want to deal with this thing. Why do I have to deal with this? I wasn't supposed to have to do this. Right? And the mind just keeps going. Mind just keeps going through <laughs> the mental proliferation regarding the experience. And of course, this is causing you more suffering. If you just had to reflect on well, okay, you know, I have to go through this or I have to experience this. Let me do it in the most skillful way possible. Let me stop this proliferation that's just going to cause me to act in ways that are going to cause me more suffering. You can observe this proliferation in your mind. You can watch this these thoughts that arise, these impulses that arise consist continuously focusing in on something. Maybe there's an object of your desire, a person, food, whatever it is. And you just watch your mind. Your mind is so fixated and it's just proliferating fantasies, thoughts, um, uh, uh, not condi I'm trying to think of the, you know, um, things that might happen, narratives, right? It's just proliferating these things over and over and over again, continuously. Because you're intoxicated, you're drunk, right? You're so wrapped up in it. 
you're just propagating over and over and over again, proliferating, propagating. So once we start to see these things, we start to deeply understand them, then we stop doing it. We let go. This proliferation, this is a lot of, this is really exhausting in the mind. I like a nice, calm, peace, quiet mind better. Why don't I meditate? Right? Proliferation is exhaustion. <laughs> Proliferation is dukkha. Does good meditation produce saliva in the mouth? Uh, I don't know. It depends on the person. Um, you know, for me, as somebody who's always very mucousy and always producing saliva, I actually put my tongue at the tip behind my, by my front teeth. I put my tongue there so that it actually stops producing lots of saliva. All right. So I don't have to worry about keeping swallowing and things like that. Um, so if you have, you know, if you want to um, control your saliva while meditating, put your tongue at the back of the front teeth. Hello, Rahul Awad. Welcome in Poland. It's late there in Poland. All right. Diego has a question. I've been following Theravada, suttas, books, Dhamma talks for a while, but there's no Theravada Sangha where I live. Should I connect with Mahayana Temple or the Zendo that are available locally? Yeah, this is this is a tough thing in, in the West, you know, um, Zen and like Tibetan and uh, various Mahayana. These are more prom prevalent. You know, th this was my exact case in New Jersey, America. <laughs> right. This was exact my case right? to find where could I find a Theravada place. And, you know, I think it depends on the person for me. I had already gone through Mahayana places to get to Theravada. And frankly, I wasn't, I wasn't going to get anything that I needed going to a Mahayana place. So for me, it, it didn't work. I, I, I would have rather, you know, drive the hour or two hours or three hours to go to a Theravada place. For you, maybe it works. Maybe it's okay. I think that's something that you have to check, you know, check for yourself. Um, you know, the, I, the early days before I found out about like, for instance, Bhavana Society in West Virginia, you know, most of the places I would visit were Mahayana places, even as a Theravada. I became a Buddhist. I, I took the refuge and precepts at a Mahayana monastery. Three years later, I did my first retreat at that Mahayana, Mahayana monastery. You know, and because I didn't know any other. And so I was like, oh, well, I want to go on retreat. Might as well go on. And it just so happened, thankfully, this Mahayana place um, actually uh, has good connections with Theravada. And there was a Theravada monastic, a very, very well-known, famous Sri Lankan Theravada monastic, no less. Um, and that monastic taught me walking meditation and changed my life. I've only met him during that one retreat. But so, you know, you just don't know. I mean, like I did go to those places, but they weren't a home for me. They could be a home for you. It depends on how you feel about things. Um, you know, it depends on what you think. You know, community is important, but if you feel like the communities are doing kind of not what what you want to do or, or you know, if it's kind of very, very different, then the community is in some ways not necessarily better than having no community. It has to depend on, it depends on you. It's not something that I could answer for you. You go to them, try to, you know, go to them, see what you can get from them. And if they're, you know, some people are more inclined to them. So even like Bhante Sudaso, even though he's a, you know, a, a, a half a Sutta scholar at this point, you know, he, you know, started out in Zen places and he has a Mahayana flair to him. There's certain things that he and I disagree with. And I, I feel he has a little bit of a Mahayana view in his things. And that's, you know, some people are like that. That's okay. That's what they do. 
right? And some people are like me who are a bit more like, you know, I'm I'm sticking with one thing. So it's it, it's a personal thing. You have to figure it out for yourself. See what really works for you. It's kind of a question, but kind of, I'm, I'm looking at Rahul Awad's two paragraphs there. Uh, it's not really a question per se, but um, it's an interesting one. I haven't heard this before. So uh, have you perhaps found it interesting? I haven't, I, I haven't found it. Well, now I find it interesting now that I'm hearing about it. But the, uh, the Chinese Agama parallel of Majjama Nikai number 26 about the noble search, which is without the fragment about the Buddha deciding not to teach and Brahma intervening. Without the fragment, the story seems more, uh, to me, more coherent and sensible. <clears throat> well, you know, one of the things about the early text in this way is, okay, so... The Agama doesn't have it, but then you have to figure out, you have to go further and figure out by the different ways, well, what are the indications that either the either the Sutta or the Agama is probably more accurate or first, right? So th that's the next step. You, if you know that next step, tell me about it. But, um, you know, th th that th these are the interesting things you'll find. You know, the, the, and this is why I say like the early Buddhist texts are the heritage of all Buddhists. It's not a Theravada thing. It's not a Mahayana thing. All Buddhists, the early texts are a heritage of because these are from a time before there was a, such a thing as Mahayana and Theravada. Right. So they're for all beings. They're for all Buddhists. And, you know, this is where you, you see these different things. Like, well, for instance, the other thing in Satipatthana Sutta. In the Agamas, the um, mindfulness of breathing is not the first thing in um, <clears throat> Kaya Nupasana. It's actually the third thing. I remember hearing this from Bhante Analio years ago. And the way he described it, actually, it made more sense. It's like a progression that's going up. So mindfulness of breathing would not be the first thing. Paying attention to posture would be the first thing. And that made a lot of sense to me. You know, so the, 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 these are the interesting things about studying the early texts and learning from people like Bhante Rahu, uh, Bhante, uh, uh, Bhante Analio and Bhante Sujato and Bhikkhu Bodhi and these, these people who are studying the early texts. Is self-deprecation a wholesome expression of humility? Is it actually humility? Well, that depends on the intention. Self-deprecation can not be humility. It can be manipulation, right? It can be all kinds of things. Um, but if you balance it out, right? If it's used to balance out, then I think it's a good thing. Like, for instance, right, because I was kind of thrown into teaching, like I, I was literally I, I ordained as a Samanera and then Bhante G had me teach in the in, in my first retreat, you know, not even a month later. Right. So I was thrown into, you know, teaching at retreats and sharing Dhamma. And I felt like it's like I'm just barely a monk. Like I, I shouldn't be doing this. It's like I'm not like, you know, because I had this idea that like monastic teachers, all of them are like very, very senior and very wise and things like that. And of course, obviously, I know that's not necessarily the case now. But I developed this thing where I would kind of like, I would talk about my faults and my struggles. And like, I, I was kind of like self-deprecating myself. And I still kind of do this to this day. 
as a way of kind of not coming across as more than I am, right? Or as a way of uh, kind of counterbalancing any kind of thoughts of like, ooh, like people like me, people listen to me and I'm a good teacher and all these things and I'm going to, you know, getting like kind of wrapped up in all of that. Right. So if you're if you're um, if you're wrapped up in too much uh, too much self aggrandizement, right, too much like, oh, I'm I'm, you know, the best thing since sliced bread and all these kind of things, then you counteract it. You say, oh, wait a second. No. No, you're not. You have all these faults still. And, you know, you need to learn more about this and that. Right? So that it, you can use it as a counteracting. When you, Whenever your mind comes up, like a judgment, I was like, oh, I'm so much better than that person. Whoa, wait a second. No, you're not. And then you can list off all these things. Now, if all you're doing is saying, God, I'm so horrible. I'm, I, I'm, I'm this and I'm that and that. That's no good. That's negative. That, that, that's just harming yourself. But if you're counteracting that, um, you know, getting getting too wrapped up in your own things and thinking yourself higher, right, then it's a good way to, to counteract that. And, you know, sometimes it's like, uh, Sometimes it's kind of a, an easy way to break the ice with somebody too, I guess, to be self-deprecating. You know, it's like having people laugh with you or at you. So I can kind of see how that might be a useful thing. But I think humility in terms of the Dhamma is that kind of trying to keep the balance trying to trying to counteract all of the mind states that would bring you towards not being humble right when you're doing that then you're being humble you know anytime that mind state comes up of judgment or if I am better than, or I am equal to, or I am, you know, less than, all that, you counteract it. You say, whoa, whoa, wait. You question. It's always important to question what comes into your mind. Don't just accept it. Don't just accept it on autopilot without any kind of questioning, any kind of investigation. Is telling someone wrong Dhamma by mistake bad karma? I said that Sotipana is the stage where you see true form of body through meditation, which is wrong by mistake. So, <clears throat> no, it's not wrong. It's not. Your intention is not to deceive. But what you should do, however, is make sure that what you tell somebody is accurate or tell them you know, I think it's this, but I could be wrong. It's better to check. Right? As long as you're not trying to intentionally deceive <clears throat> or mislead the person, no, it's not bad karma. But you want to always try to make sure that you are passing along good dhamma. Right? And especially like with this things, like various certain aspects about sotipanas and things like that, that's quite complicated, right? You can, you, we can go into the suttas and see things. And we could also go into the commentaries and later things that talk more about sotipanas, right? But, you know, there's, there's not like an extreme amount of detail and a lot of different teachers teach different things, right? So there's lots of room for confusion there, right? So the best thing is to always try to you know, have the aspiration that what you're passing through is true to the best of your knowledge and ability. And also to be okay to say, I don't know. 
when I first started teaching there in the early days, that's one thing that I knew that it was, I was okay to do. Like somebody asked me a question, right? How many of these questions? I couldn't answer the question. So I say, I don't know, right? Even today, even though I've been, you know, teaching now for like seven years, still there's some questions where I could maybe attempt to kind of give an answer, but it's probably better that I don't. Because most of it might be just totally made up, right? Or going off of, you know, like a very, very little knowledge. So somebody asked me a question about bodhisattvas. I wouldn't answer the question. Not because like, oh, bodhisattvas, they're stupid. Is Mahayana stupid? No, it's because I'm not Mahayana. So I wouldn't know the, the, very, the intricate details and the intricate understandings that somebody who is Mahayana would know. Right. So I'm, I wouldn't I, I'm not going to. It's like the, the medical thing. Right. It, it at least do no harm. So it's better that I do no harm and not answer the question. than to answer the question, because I feel pressured that I should answer the question. And so it's OK to say you don't know and leave it at that. Visaka, I'm kind of tired. Uh, <clears throat> Visaka asked, how is my favorite monk tonight? And also, no favorite monks. That's attachment. <laughs> yes, I am. But even though we all have favorite monks, you know, my favorite monk is Ajahn Chah. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. But I would say aim higher <laughs> than Bhante Jayasara. Uh, all right. Sunya says, I don't have a permanent residence, so I do a lot of relocation. Are you part of that? There, there's an interesting group called Buddhist boondockers. It's all about the Buddhist people who basically just kind of live in vans and stuff and drive around. That's it. When you say this, that's what it sounded like to me. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any advice for maintaining practice in this situation? This is a, ta this is a hard one. Right. This is a real hard one because this is I know I'm, you know, the last two and a half years or so I've been a nomad monk, which means for the most part, you know, I stay at a place for a month. Then I go to another place for a month. Then I go to another place for a month. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm by my I'm on my own. I can do all my own things. Now I'm in a monastery and I can't do all my own things. And and I have to, you know, kind of figure out. So. It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting training. And what I would say is try to have, try to have a schedule that you do no matter who, where you are, right? The times of what you're doing might change, but you say every day I'm going to do this, every day I'm going to do that. And then you know, when you're at one place, maybe you could do it in the morning and another place, maybe you have to do it in the afternoon, right? So you're setting some kind of stability, some kind of rock, some kind of anchor, right? But being flexible with that. This is what I do. I have a certain thing, maybe like five to seven things I try to do every day, like read some suttas, study some Pali, do some writing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And every time I go to a different place, I, I don't have the ability to do that in the same exact time. Right? But I'm going to try to keep that stability within being flexible. So that's what I would say. Right? You know, if you're moving around a lot, you're relocating a lot. That's a training in and of itself. That's definitely a training in and of itself. You can learn from it. Try to investigate, try to work with it, try to see what works and see what doesn't. That's what I've been doing these last two and a half years. Finding some kind of stability 
within the movement, I think is a, is a good grounding tool. Jeff has a question, which texts are good to read and reread, or is it better just to listen to Dhamma talks? Both. Um, depends on what you're trying to do, right? My, my suggestion would be to read all the suttas, right? And uh, that's something that Bhante Siddhasa says all the time, right? <laughs> he said that to me when I just moved to the monastery. You know, this is going back almost nine years ago now, right? And he says, are you reading all the suttas? And I was like, yeah, pretty much. I had read the Digi Nikaya by that point, and I was starting the Majja Nikaya, and he said, okay, go read all the suttas. And I said, don't worry, I'm continuing to do it. Right? <clears throat> so I would say read the suttas. Suttas are very important. And, of course, it's hard to, you know, when you're getting into the suttas, there's, there, it's hard to kind of, uh, you know, there's a, it's, a hard, it's a high barrier to entry. Right, because you there's lots of repetition, there's lots of context you're not aware of, all these kind of things. Um, speaking of which, in two weeks, I'm going to be doing a Zoom retreat all about the these topics, about understanding the suttas, right? How to get into the suttas, how to deal with the repetition, how to understand the context, all that stuff. It's going to be like a reading the suttas one on one. So uh, you can go to my website and check out that. Find it there. But um, this is important. I would say read the suttas and then listen to various monastic teachers who give commentary on the suttas. Bhante Sudaso does it twice a week, right? I did it this morning um, because Bhante, they're, they're on an airplane and they're in, on the other side of the, the continent now. But, um, you know, you can do that. Listen to uh, monastics who give commentary on the suttas. And then you get to understand and know. So you can listen to both. It's, it, it's two for the price of one. Dhamma talks and reading suttas. Das has a question, but I basically already answered about how to use humility skillfully. Yeah, you want to use it, as I said, like as a balancing tool. Obviously, we've all seen people who are fake humility. People, oh, you know, like these kind of things. We see that what, what fake humility is, right? We don't want to do that. We want to truly practice being humble. Right? When you practice being humble, counteracting all the um, arrogance and the, the puffed upness, right? the I'm better than-ness, then you are practicing being humble. You're practicing developing humility. That's a good thing. Cindy says, I want to be a Buddhist boondocker. So, yeah, Cindy, if you're on Facebook, look it up, Buddhist boondocker. There's a, it's a, a lady started it like a year or two ago who I used to know from Bhavana. <clears throat> and they have like, okay, we're all, we're, you know, we're meeting and such and such. Now they're doing things with monastics. They're like doing like, uh, I, I think I gave them the idea about monastics and lay people being around a campfire. So they're doing things where they have monastics come um, and be, a, you know, to teach them and things like that, where, where there are different places. So it's a pretty neat thing. All right. Hassan asked a very good question. 
Disenchantment is something to be developed, it says in the suttas. Is that relating to worldly desires or just experience itself? Both. So the Buddha talks about three kinds of dukkha. Dukkha dukkha, which is physical pain. Viparanama dukkha, which is viparanama is the dukkha of change. Things are changing, arising and ceasing, getting old and decaying. Right? Jobs are being lost. Relationships are being broken and then coming back and in, coming into being different. Relate. All these things are moving. And then the last one, Sankara Dukkha. The Dukkha of all that is conditioned. So <clears throat> the Buddha is saying that when you practice the Dhamma, when you follow the Noble Eightfold Path, you practice Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. Then naturally, so normally what happens is we have delusion. Because of our ignorance, we don't see things right. We see things like we're looking through like glasses that are really fogged up or really dirty. And you're trying to see things through that. And you see things wrongly. You attach to things. You become intoxicated to things. But then as you start to investigate, as you start to question, as you start to understand, you start to see things. The, the glasses start to get cleaner. And you start to see things. It's like, why was I so intoxicated by that? Jeez, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Disenchantment has arisen. You see things as they are more and more and more. And you see that you used to think, like there's a famous quote in the Dhammapada, what their average person sees as happiness, the awakened one sees as suffering. What the awakened one sees as suffering, the average person sees as happiness. Why? Because we're deluded. Because we're not seeing things rightly. But as we practice, follow the Noble full Path, then our glasses start to get clean. Our eyesight starts to get sharp. We see things as they are. And naturally, disenchantment arises. Nibbida. Bhante Siddhartha has been talking about this a lot. right? The, the, these three uh, words. Nibbida, disenchantment. And then when disenchantment <clears throat> arises, I was like, ah, you know, I used to go to the club on the weekends. Doesn't really do, do anything for me like it used to. I don't feel like going anymore. This passion. There's no passion to do it anymore. There's no fire. There's no pep in your step to go to the club anymore. And then when you have Nibida and Viraga, disenchantment, dispassion, you have Vimutti, freedom. But you need to have, you need to see things as they are first. Then you let go. You naturally let go. No attachment. Naturally. And then you're free. Whoa. Oh. Okay. Just had a weird bug where all the questions just disappeared and there was no text. Okay. Diego, you're a man after my own heart, as they say. Very good. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Every morning I recollect the five remembrances. Everybody should do this. The Buddha says, whether you're a woman or a man, layperson or ordained, you should reflect on these things. 
So you should do it every morning at least. Maybe even a couple times a day, but at least once a day. Trying to visualize myself and people I love getting old, sick, and dead. Any tips on the practice? Thanks for answering my previous question. Yeah, no, that's a very good, that's that's a good start. Very good start. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Well, what I what I do and, and how I teach and when I do a guided meditation of this, I do it because this is what I would reflect on. Like so when I reflect on um, you know, I am subject to old age, I've not gone beyond old age. Now, obviously, I visualize myself getting older, you know, just like as you're saying, that's good. Then I reflect because in this sutta, the Buddha says, not only are you subject to these things, right? So you reflect on other beings, but, you know, you can also go. I also like to go out to, like, for instance, trees. You can go in the forest and you can see old trees. You can go in the forest and you can see sick trees with like big cancerous tumors and things like that or different various diseases. You can go, you can see how mountains even grow old. In America, you can see a young mountain range and an old mountain range. The young mountain range are the Rockies. The oldest, yeah, the oldest mountain range on the planet currently is the Appalachian mountain range, right, on the East Coast. So you can reflect on, you can see this not only just in living beings, but you can see it everywhere. Death, yes. Yourself and your loved ones, yes. But also the planet, the sun, the galaxy. Like you can go like, what you, like that helps me to like really reflect on it. It's like, this is just the, really the nature of things. This is way beyond me. Like in the traditional um, Madan Anusati uh, chant that they chant in Sri Lanka with the, um, you know, when somebody dies, one of the lines goes something like, even those great in wisdom and power die, let alone someone like me. Right. So it's like taking that another step. It's like just really reflecting. Whoa, wait a second. Yeah, this is like nobody's getting out of this. <laughs> this is the nature of things. Like if even if even supposedly the universe may eventually die, then what the heck am I now? Of course I'm going to die. Of course. Right. So so you know going going around and like really reflecting on you know um, whatever you can reflect on. I think it's a very good thing. You know that that's um, whatever different ways. Like one of the one of the things that I learned. I remember. I was a lay person and I was in my early days of visiting Bhavana. So we're talking maybe 2012 ish. Um, and I was talking to a fellow, uh, a woman who's a fellow Dhamma practitioner. And right, we were talking in the Sangha Hall. And she mentioned a practice that she said she got from Tanisara Bhikkhu. Um, I could never confirm this. I never see, I've never seen him like a teaching where he says this. But it's a wonderful practice and I love I started putting it into practice and I still love it to this day. And I still use it actually when I do mindfulness of death uh, retreats. So it's like visualizing yourself in front of you, like, you know, sitting or whatever, and then observing, watching your yourself get old. Right. And decrepit and then eventually just drop over dead and then um I added to that as I, cause I was doing this by own practice. Then I added to that. That's the perfect transition to charnel ground contemplation, how the body decays. Right. So that was a very, you know, cause because I'm, I visuals are really um, impactful for me cause I'm a visual, very visual person. Um, you know, using visuals like that are really powerful. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, that's going to be me. You know, interesting, one of the things that's really been bringing up a lot of urgency for me lately is, you know, I'm, I'm building up my own organization and I'm planning and thinking about the future and, you know, having a monastery and all these kind of things. And what I notice is my mind is thinking of myself 20 years from now as me now. 
right? My mind is, I'm like, well, wait, wait a second, man. You're going to be old. <laughs> like by the time you actually like, you know, if you have a forest monastery and disciples, is like, you're going to be old, man. You're going to be like 60, 70, whatever. Like, you know, it's like, but my mind has a hard time thinking about that because we're always thinking about, oh, well, this is going to be me, right? Because it's almost like I, I've been around lots and lots of older people um, in my life which is a blessing. It's one of the most, it's a divine messenger. And one of the things that almost all of them say is my mind feels like the same mind from when I was in my twenties, <laughs> right? Like the mind, it's almost like this kind of like the mind doesn't change. The mind is still thinking like, Oh, I'm just going to live forever. I'm just going to be this way forever. It's not going to change, but no, it is. So like the, that, like the, it, it's like been a gut punch for me to realize like, well, you know, like I'm 44, or I'm going to be 45, you know, next April. So it's like, well, wait a second. By the time this, I'm going to be like 60. Whoa. You know, and of course, obviously, you know, you know, some pe people will be like, you know, oh, 60. That's nothing. That's young, obviously. Like even Bate G would call, you know, he's 95 now. And I remember call him calling people in their 60s youngsters. Right. So obviously it's relative. But. You know, when you think about life expectancy and such and such, you're like, you know, six, you know, 60, 70, that's what, you know, that's getting close. That's getting towards the end there. Right. And, and so my mind, even though I've been doing stuff like practicing the five remembrances for 16 years, 15, 16 years, I've been doing this practice, mindfulness of death practice, still. Oftentimes, my mind doesn't believe it. Oftentimes, my mind, like I can remember doing this, this five remembrances. This was maybe about five or six years ago at Bhavana. I would go in front of the, the skeleton hanging in the front of the meditation hall. And I would reflect, I am subject to old age. I am subject to illness. You know, and I'd go through the thing. <clears throat> and I remember losing my mindfulness for a split second. And I watched my mind say this. I am subject to death. I am exempt from death. And that clicked. I was like, wait a second. You're not exempt from death, you foolish. <laughs> right? But I observed that my mind, even though I had still been practicing for years by that point, my mind still was deluded, still thought it was exempt from death. Even now, I look at my mind, even though I've been around, I've watched very close people to me die since I was eight years old. I've been to many funerals. I've watched people die. I practice all this way. But still, I can see in my mind that there's a lot of delusion about this stuff in there. Very, very, you know, important to see. So doing this practice is very good. I, I, I'm uh, very uh, proud of you. Keep going with that practice. Very good. Sadhu. It's a practice that a lot of people don't. I don't know. This is not really a Dhamma question. Why would I be a CPS? Why would I become a CPS officer? Um, for me, it was a job that was open. <laughs> so I took it. You know, I've been trying to be a teacher for a bunch of years and it didn't work out. So I got into that. All right. Now back to a Dhamma question. Hmm. <sighs> Bonte, I have a friend who gets a lot, a lot of suicidal thoughts. This is not really a Dhamma question either. Um, he tells me that living is not worth it and there's just so much suffering. No matter what I say, he remains unconvinced. What can I tell him? Um, well, the first thing I would say is the best thing to do for this regard is to talk to like a suicide prevention um, hotline. Like they're going to be the best ones for that. To talk to, you know, call up a suicide prevention hotline, tell them this, see what they say. You know, a, a lot of times when somebody is in a very, very strong emotional mind state, trying to be logical with them, trying to reason with them, it doesn't work. You know, like I have done things like stayed up all night with somebody because they were suicidal. 
right, to bring them to the hospital the next day, stuff like that. I, I've, you know, my job and, you know, also in just in, in life with friends, right, I've had this experience of, of being with suicidal people. Um, and, you know, like even a Bhavana is a, a good friend. Um, he became a good friend. Uh, you know, he was a resident. And I remember him coming to me one night and, you know, he didn't want to go to the hospital in the middle of the night. But I said, OK, you're staying in my room. I was a monk at the time. I was a um, I think it was in my my first year or second year as a bhikkhu. And I said, OK, you're staying in my room and I'm sleeping right at the door. Like you're not getting out of this room. Right. And so, you know, we we, you know, stayed up talking a lot and we went to bed and and we woke up and the next day I took him to the hospital. Well, technically. He took me because <laughs> he was driving. Um, I drove back. But um, but yeah, you know, so this is. Um, there are things to do and there's things that sometimes somebody's so far gone that even a professional can't convince them, right? So what I would do is try to, um, try to have them, you know, talk to a suicide prevention hotline, follow their advice. That's what I would say. I listened to this audio book this week and it was really great for learning meditation, Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana. Yeah, Bhante Gunaratana is who ordained me. <clears throat> That's where I lived at Bhavana Society. He has, um, in my opinion, an even better book. It's the first book that I read is uh, Four Foundations of Mindfulness in Plain English, Satipatthana in Plain English. Very good. Very good for beginners. All the in plain English books. Elaine's saying volunteer at a nursing home and talk to some of the residents. Yeah, um, Elaine slash Visaka, I actually. I actually wanted to volunteer at a hospice place um, in the hospital and stuff. I tried to volunteer, but they demanded too much of, I, I couldn't because I was already a professional. They demanded too much time. Like the, like you're a professional, you know, you're, you're not going to, you have too much busy, you know, doing your own career. You can't do this. So I said, okay, but yeah. I think that's a good thing. Volunteering, you know, talk to older people. P older people, you know, especially these days where they're kind of dumped in places, they like to tell stories, right? And, you know, if you're the person that likes to hear stories, I love hearing stories. I've been hearing stories from older people since I was a, a little kid. So, you know, just just being somebody who's listening to somebody who's older, that's so such a good deed. It's a very compassionate, metafold, metafilled deed. All right. So we have come to the end of questions. Any questions from the monastery? Give it another minute or two or three, and then if there's no more questions, we'll end. All right. Okay, friends. Well, 
I think that's uh, the end for this uh, monk chat. So have a good weekend. Suki Hotu, may you be happy. Practice well and be well. May you have a spiritually successful and peaceful practice until we meet again.